Hello and welcome to Off Track Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ram Kumar. So for this week's episode of the podcast, we have a very, very interesting guest with us. It's the person who you've probably seen, you've probably heard from, you've probably heard his podcast, you've probably heard his talks on science and science communication and you've probably seen memes of him. So he's so famous for so many things and especially and most important of all being able to communicate his science in a very effective way to everyone. I'm talking about the one and only Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, director of the Hayden Planetarium and one of the leading astrophysicists in the world. So without any further ado, let's jump straight into the episode and see what Dr. Tyson has to say. Dr. Tyson, welcome, welcome, welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with me here today. Well, well thank you. And please call me Neil. That's fine. Neil, of course. Mm-hmm. So we, we're going to have a few different topics that we're going to discuss today. Primarily, it's going to be about your book, which is A Brief Welcome to the Universe. It's a pocket-sized story. It literally fits in my pocket. I would highly recommend people to pick up a copy of this book. And then a few more questions on your approach to communicating science, because... In today's day and age, science communication is of utmost importance. So let's jump straight in to the first part of our discussion, which is on the book. So we've, we've, we've understood that the universe is expanding, and it's been expanding since the Big Bang. But what is around the universe into which it's expanding? Oh, we have no idea. Next question. <laughs> 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 no, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. Yeah. Um, in the multiverse concept, which actually flows naturally out of the quantum relativistic equations that try to account for the earliest moments of the universe. I mean, just at, at the risk of saying what, saying what might be obvious to all of your 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 audience. The quantum physics is the most successful understanding of the universe that has ever been put forth. Nothing has ever been shown to be wrong in predictions that it has made. So it's been extraordinary. Then you, and so that's, of course, the science of the small. And then you have the science of the large, which comes to us from Einstein's general theory of relativity. And that applies to everything large scale. But we know it fails at singularities, where you're essentially dividing by zero, if you will. If I can use a, a, a schoolyard example, uh, reference to that. And so we know there's a limit. And so either uh, quantum physics can absorb general relativity as some special case, or we're in the search of a third understanding of the universe, a third theory of the universe that encloses both of those. And then that would be the one that has no limits to it at all. Uh, it, or, or, or maybe not. I mean, I don't know. My point is that when the universe was small, then quantum physics matters to the entire universe, right? If the universe was the size of an atom and quantum physics affects things that are the sizes of atoms, then quantum rules apply. And when you do this, you find ways that more than one universe are formed. And in the simplest of these, there is one space-time that all the universes exist in, but we each exist in a pocket of that, an expanding pocket out to our own horizon within that space time. And so, so when you want to ask, what are we expanding into? Well, we are expanding, we're part of a fabric that is expanding and our space time with a, with a 14 billion light year horizon, if, since when the, the oldest light that has reached us, and that's expanding in this larger meta space time, if you will. And each pocket 
is then a whole other universe that does not interact with adjacent universes. And there have been people who have looked for whether any these universes are expanding and then bumping into each other. They're looking for signatures of that in the, in the uh, cosmic microwave background, but they haven't found it yet. So, um, so that's the, the least exotic of the multiverse scenarios, because if we're all in the same space time, we all share the same laws of physics. There are higher level versions of this where different universes have different laws of physics and they could be infinite separate from each other, which means they're embedded in a higher dimensionality of space. And so a, a fun way to think about that is, let's say we all lived in a flat sheet of paper, okay? So we're in a two-dimensional universe. That sheet of paper can go infinite in its two coordinates, infinitely deep in X and in Y, okay? So now get another sheet of paper. That could also be infinite, yet that sheet of paper would not necessarily have to intersect the first sheet of paper that you list, that you presented. And they could be very close to each other. This would be like a parallel universe you might feel, right? <laughs> As people like to believe. But you have two infinite universes that don't interact with each other because they're embedded in higher dimensional space. So there are a lot of scenarios like this that get explored. And uh, my previous book called Cosmic Queries came out uh, earlier, uh, late last year. Uh, that book um, is takes all the deepest questions that were ever asked about the universe. Like, um, how did it all get here? How did it all begin? How is it all going to end? Uh, are we in a multiverse? Are we in a simulation? And all of those scenarios are fully explored there. In the pocket tour, you are <laughs> we touch those subjects just enough to whet your appetite so that you've done with this and say, I got to learn more. And then you go out and buy more books. Yeah. That's how that works. Yeah, I mean, that's... That's how curiosity is supposed to work, right? And I think this. Yeah, I think, thank you. Thank you. Curiosity. That's how that goes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I kind of want to ask you, what drew you to study physics and the cosmos? Because as as a, as a student, it's important to develop interest. So how did you develop interest when you were studying or when you were, you know, when you were a kid? Well, it started early. Yeah, I was nine years old, and a first visit to my local planetarium which in New York City, where I grew up, is the Hayden Planetarium. And I now serve as its director, so that's kind of weird. Um, and But the, well, it's not weird, it's just, it's its own closed loop, I guess. It's, but it's what a it different means trajectory, is the, I guess. <laughs> what it means is what, what, every day I go to work and I see visitors to the institution who were my age when I first visited, and I was so influenced by educators and scientists on staff at the time, I say I, I have a duty, I have an obligation to ensure that a next generation is, is uh, influenced and inspired in no, with no less intensity than I was back when I was nine years old. And it was the first visit where the lights turned out and the stars came out in the, in the dome and the dome disappears and it's just an infinite universe above your head. I mean, it, it emotionally disappears, psychologically. And, and planetarium theaters, in a way, were the first virtual reality spaces when you think about it. And because you, you get transported. And I was hooked ever since. And I remembered thinking, I think by the time I was 12 or 13, this stuff is so interesting. Everybody's going to want to study it. And there'll be no room for me. That's what I said. And then as I got older, I said, no, people are interested in other things. That's fine. And so maybe there will be room for me one day. And so I was able to align my life. And then I said, I want to know more about the universe. And so I need to, how do I best commune with the cosmos? Well, I need math fluency. And of course, physics is foundational in this. So in college, I majored in physics and my PhD is in astrophysics, but college the physics all the way, and of course the math is, it, you know, I, I the way I tell people this who hate math, I say, well, you can imagine learning a foreign language, can't you? You know, if you're native English and you want to go to Spain, you can learn Spanish. You want to go to R Russia, you can learn Russian. You want to go to China, you learn 
Chinese or Mandarin. You want to visit the universe, you learn math, okay? And math will take you there. And people say, well, I'm not good at math. Well, are you good at Mandarin? No, because you haven't tried yet, okay? And by the way, it takes years and years and years. So to me, it's no different. If you, it's just the language of how the universe is trying to talk to us. So that's how I think about math, and, and that's the physics. And all of that was with the singular goal of, of learning as much as I could about the universe so that one day I might contribute to that moving frontier. Okay. This is, this, it's quite fascinating because in school, when I was a kid, we, we all learned about planets and everything. So that really was super attractive to me as, a, as uh, you know, like I wanted to study physics, but then I found a different calling in biology because right now I'm doing biology and that, that's my, my PhD is in biology. But I just, I just, I mean, I'm still very interested in astrophysics and I used to be part of astronomy clubs and everything. And the, the reason I'm talking so much about this is because we all learned in school about Pluto and Pluto being a planet. And you know where I'm going with this. Hold so, me back. Don't get me stuck. <laughs> no, no. The, the point I'm trying to make is it's, it's true that Pluto doesn't fit in with the planet it's around or the other planets that it's around. So it got kicked out of the solar system and then it's out into the, it's a part of a Kuiper belt or a dwarf planet, right? So my question is not about Pluto itself, but about its moon. So can we still call it a moon if it's not a planet? Is there a different terminology one should use for a satellite of a of another dwarf planet instead of calling it a moon? I think we can call it whatever makes sense. And so the, the limit there, I think, is not whether a dwarf planet has something orbiting it that we might call a moon. Uh, I'd I, I like where you're headed there, but let me let me refine it and make it even better. Okay. I think a, a, a better criterion is not is not to ask can a dwarf planet have a moon it's if you have a moon where is the center of mass between the two of you no if something is orbiting you where is your center of mass if the center of mass is inside the larger object as it is for earth and our moon okay then you can legitimately say the moon orbits earth Okay, because Earth is just sort of jiggling. The the center of mass is about, uh, what would this be? About 1,500 kilometers beneath Earth's surface on a line connecting the center of the moon to the center of the Earth. And so Earth is jiggling around that. The moon has a full orbit around it. Fully legit. And that's true for all moons of all the eight planets. Okay. It's also true of the sun and all the planets orbiting the sun. The center of mass between the sun and any one planet is inside the sun, okay? But of course, it's not the center of the sun because you do the physics on that, it pulls it away a little bit, all right? In the case of Pluto, Pluto's principal moon, it has several moons, Charon, the center of mass is outside of the physical body of Pluto. So if you wanted a precise mathematical physics excuse, to call it something different, then look to see if the center of mass is in none of the in neither of these objects, in which case you can call it a double dwarf planet rather than a dwarf planet and a moon of a dwarf planet. So that's where I would lead you if you wanted to sort of refine or revise vocabulary to convey some sort of uh, information that the previous vocabulary did not. Mm-hmm. That that's quite interesting because when 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 I was reading this in the book, it was it, it re- really drew me to think about how one so when you define certain thing as a planet or a dwarf planet, and you talk about the way the orbit of the planet is around, let's say, the sun. So then, the orbit of the moon should also be, or any uh, satellite should be jiggling the 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 planet or whatever it's revolving around. So, I mean, this, this is where the idea came from to, for me to ask this question. Yes, yes. And so, like I said, your, your question was, your heart was in the right place. <laughs> and so 
to, to the extent that what I just said, give, you know, adds sharpens the teeth of your effort to try to come up with different words that I think mm -hmm. that would, that would be the way to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one more question about the book before we move on to ask a bit more questions about communicating science. So the well, last just let me one slip is about... something in there. You said yeah. you majored in biology, you know, in recent decades, almost all the scientific professions have merged with astrophysics in certain questions that we ask about the universe. We're on Mars, we need a geologist to help us out, but we're looking for life, we need a biologist. So we have astrogeology, astrobiology. We have astrochemistry. So, so there's been a lot of stapling together of different professions that were previously stovepiped because there are certain questions we ask about the universe that requires your expertise that I don't have. And the rise of journals with these juxtaposed titles is evidence of that. And so, yes, you can... If you have a love of the universe and you studied biology, we'll still take you. We need you. <laughs> okay. I think that's a message for all the listeners out there. So yeah, yeah. I, if I'm walking around on Mars, I don't want to step in life and I without knowing what it was. <laughs> you say, watch out for that. That's a microbial, whatever. I say, oh my gosh. Okay. okay. I'm just an astrophysicist. You're the one. You can guide me through this um, alien jungle of microbes. Okay. All right. So my last question about the book, it's about the Drake equation. You mentioned this in the book, and it, it's a really fascinating equation. It's basically trying to sort of estimate uh, the possible number of uh, communicating civilizations that we could have in the galaxy today, right? So, I mean, there are so many factors that go. It's, it's like a series of multiplication of different fractions with the number of observable galaxies that we have, let's say, within our communicable vicinity. So my question is, is there a certain type of cosmic fingerprint that the Earth exhibits which we can somehow apply to the different planets that we're identifying based on the transitions in front of the sun, so in, the, in front of their suns? So is there, is there something that one can sort of calculate based on this which you can use for identifying these sort of planets which can have civilizations. So we do that all the time. And what you're describing is what you're asking is the very straight question. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're looking for other planets orbiting other stars, exoplanets, mm -hmm. um, would we be able to discover earth? What would it look like? What would yeah. our signature be? And maybe that can help inform the signatures we then look for. Yeah. So the transit method that you briefly mentioned there is because the stars are so much brighter than the reflected light off of the planets that orbit them, that you, you can't directly see the planet. It's very hard unless the planet is huge. Something the size of Earth, you're not seeing it. But we do measure the brightnesses of stars with very high precision. So that if we happen to have a star system where its orbits are sort of in the plane of your field of view, yeah. then as, as, they, as the planets orbit, they will pass in front of the star. And in our solar system, Earth occupies one, uh, one ten thousandth of the area of the sun, okay, as yeah. it passes in front. If you can measure the brightness of a star to better than one part in 10,000, you will be able to detect a dip in the brightness of that star. because the st And then it, that dip stays for a while, and then it goes back up. And then it repeats later on. Mm -hmm. So this, th that's how you know it's not just some fluke. That is something mm -hmm. periodic, which is what you'd expect for a planet. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the holy grails of this entire exercise is would we be able to detect Earth? And the answer is yes. For stars that are near enough to us with the right telescopes, which we have launched, the Kepler telescope, mm -hmm. the, the space-borne telescope was among them. Yes, we can find Earth. And that's just finding the Earth. If you want to go back into the Drake equation and say, is there civilization there and can they communicate? Yeah. Well, there's another cottage industry within us where they're looking for the chemical signature, spectroscopic signature of the chemicals in the atmosphere of the planet that's transiting the star. So now you have light from the star in the background right now, and it comes through the atmosphere, and the chemistry of the atmosphere will leave its fingerprint on that light. 
very high precision measurements you can make. And you can see if there's oxygen or methane or carbon dioxide or, or, or water, the water molecule. And we have a list of molecules which are biogenic, all right? Yeah. Would, they don't have to be in all cases, but we know from earth biology that they can produce this suite of molecules. And so we, we have people, this is part of the cottage industry, of yeah. the biologist and the astrophysicist looking for these signatures. All right. <clears throat> now I've joked that suppose in that signature you find like smog and and, <laughs> and other things in the atmosphere, that would be the sure sign of no intelligent life at all. <laughs> 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 Move on to the next planet. Um, I but mean, I, I think if uh, alien civilization uh, checked Earth, they might have moved on. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. So, but I think the more significant measurement here, and yeah. the last I checked, this was true, but I, forgive me for not having sort of verified this, but I, I'm pretty sure this is true. The The sun um, is, a, is a, of course, it gives off mostly visible light, but it also gives off radio waves. And the Drake equation has implicit in it the fact that you'd be communicating with radio waves because the civilization would not only be advanced and intelligent and they'd have technology to do this. Why would we use radio waves? Because they can pass through the obscuring dust clouds of the galaxy, whereas visible light would get blocked and scattered if you had some sort of light signal, visible light signaling mechanism. So we assume the aliens would know you, you want to use radio waves. Earth with all of our radio signals. And this, I, I'm pretty sure this was true several years ago. I don't know if it's still true because everybody's now getting their signals by cable. There was a day when your TV, your radio, everything was happening through the air with escaping radio waves. And so there was a day when Earth would have been the brightest radio source in this sector of the galaxy. So all you have to do is scan for significant radio waves from objects that you don't otherwise expect to be generating radio waves, then that's a sure sign that something else is going on down there, possibly life, whether or not they're actually trying to communicate with you. And one of the challenges of the Drake equation is one of the terms is what fraction of all the planets that have life have intelligent life. That's fine, but that's not good enough because if someone is sending signals to us and the Roman empire was on that, all right, we definitely would count them as intelligent, but they're not listening for radio waves because yeah. electromagnetic energy was not yet understood or discovered. Or so, so you have to add in the part about the technology, and they have to be having that technology at the time the signal reaches them. Yeah, maybe they go extinct and it just goes by. Maybe they're on the on the dawn of the technology and you miss them that way as well. So this Drake equation, which is the series of fractions. What is the fraction of stars with planets? Fraction of stars with planets in the habitable zone. Habitable zone, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You just keep going down this list and you're hacking away at what's admittedly started as a huge number, number of stars yeah. in the galaxy, right? And then you get down, my gosh, how many? Maybe there aren't many at all, you know? It's at less so, than 108 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So we have, we have, we give the very latest estimate of that in yeah. the book. Uh, but uh, so the Drake equation is not so much an equation based on some theory of the universe, it's a way to organize our knowledge about what's out there. And so each term is an entire branch of astrophysics. You know, what fraction of stars have planets? That's, we have pe top people who worked on that. What fraction of stars have planets are in the Goldilocks zone? We have data on that now. There's now like 4,000 or so exoplanets and rising in the catalogs. So we have enough data to get some statistical sense of that. And you just keep doing that. But these are different research programs, each term of that equation. And the biggest uncertainty, I think we'd all agree, is, oh, one of the ones is, how long does a technologically able civilization last? Are they so capable that they can destroy themselves and they become the seeds of their own undoing? That's probably, you know, so does such a civilization last for a hundred years, a thousand years, yeah. a million years, a billion years? We don't know. I mean, in our case, for example, we've been a civilization capable of understand, understanding electromagnetic waves 
for less than a hundred years, maybe 150 years. Yeah. Right. That's not, about not right. longer. So maybe that's 150 years out of, you know, a few hundred thousand, which is yeah. the, uh, how long our species has been sort of identified on earth. So that's very small. Yeah. It's really, really small fraction. So, I mean, it's really interesting. So, I mean, if there are, if people have more questions after all this discussion, they should really go and, uh, you know, pick up a copy of the book and maybe even bigger books so they can start to understand <laughs> astrophysics. You, you start know, with a little bit because yeah. you can you can take that while you're waiting for the bus or the train or whatever. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, you you're you're one of the most famous science communicators out there. So you you discuss science with people and you talk science. And in today's day and age, talking science is so 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 important. So. I, I want to ask you a few questions based on that. So, and the first one that I have is, how do you talk science with people without sounding patronizing or agonizing? How, how do you do that? How does one go about talking science without making others feel dumb? Yeah, that's a very important question. And I would say many people who attempt this are guilty of just that. And they're guilty not even knowing they're guilty of it. They're just speaking as they would to their colleagues and without realizing that there's a jargon barrier, there's a concept barrier, there's a background barrier, all of these uh, impede the, uh, the capacity to communicate effectively. And I'm using the word impede, I'm reminded in physics, in, in electronics, um, when you're, there's certain circuits where you want to match the impedance <laughs> of two, two circuit elements to, to, to maximize the effectiveness of the current. And so an impedance match would mean I've studied how you think and how your brain is wired. And I take information that I want to share with you and I shape it such that I maximize the likelihood that you will not only hear it, absorb it, retain it, and even like it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's sort of the art of communication. Otherwise you're just giving a lecture, right? Any one of us who have expertise can stand in front of a chalkboard or whatever, the whiteboards, whatever they are today. And what did you grow up on, a chalkboard or a whiteboard? Chalkboard. Yeah, so, okay. I grew up on a chalkboard. I was okay, I, I'm so a you're, 90s kid. So. so you're an old fart. You see, admit it. You got... <laughs> I'm a 90s kid. So yeah, so the, okay. it was, was very started. But by the time it I was, finished school, it was already a whiteboard. It was a whiteboard. Okay, so you get to tell those stories to your grandkids. When I was done, we we had to wipe <laughs> ourselves clean. And we had a chalk. We had a, 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 a first, an official person whose job it was to erase the board with water. It used to be a board monitor. The board monitor. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so where was I before I interrupted myself? <laughs> uh, I was okay. So you. When you, if you just give a lecture, you're speaking to the chalkboard without regard to whether anyone is paying attention yeah. or is interested or whether they're absorbing it. And in most settings, you don't have to care because they paid to go to college and it's their job to learn whatever it is you put on the board. Mm -hmm. So the forces operating on a teaching faculty are different. And I think mostly relaxed relative to the forces operating on someone who's out there in the public attempting to bring all of this to people mm -hmm. who are not otherwise obligated to learn what you're telling them. And so I spend a lot of time more than I really want to, but I think I have to uh, absorbing or exposing mm -hmm. uh, my uh, awareness to pop culture. Yeah. And the definition of pop culture, what makes pop culture fascinating is it's pop, right? Everybody has some common knowledge of what is going on in pop culture, okay? You've heard of Kim Kardashian. You know who Whoopi Goldberg is. You know uh, Beyonce. Even if you don't buy their music or watch their shows, you've heard of them. Yeah, There's a certain sure. fluency that people share, which is what then defines pop culture. So I spend time learning what was the, the top TV show, what are the top movies, and I'll watch those movies. I will find out what are people buzzing about, what is the politics of the day, what are, um, how's the tribalism that's marking the landscape, how's that manifesting in recent weeks, all right? I have all of this, and I think of it as like a, a toolkit or, or, or a utility belt, okay, yeah. like Batman uses, and I'm in a situation, and I'm speaking to someone, how old are they? Uh, what part of the world are they from? 
and I will bring in references that are most relevant to them that they didn't have to study before they walked up to me because it was yeah. built into the pop culture of their world. Mm -hmm. And I will use these as launch points, as reference points, as bouncing points for all the ideas that I put on the table. And I would say, do you remember that scene in the movie The Martian where he does this? Well, that's like this, okay? So, so just I'll give an example. Um, uh, they speak of wind storms on Mars, dust storms. Mm -hmm. And that might be a little bit of an exaggeration because the air pressure on Mars is only one one hundredth that here on Earth. Yeah. So high speed winds on Mars are like gently blowing into the microphone. <sighs> you know, it's it's like, and so in the scene in The Martian where the ship, where they have to abandon um, Matt yeah. Damon, they give him up for dead because otherwise they're not going to be able to take off because the dust storm is coming and the ship is rocking. And I'm saying, no, <laughs> the ship is not going to rock. This, this is a gentle breeze, even at 100 miles an hour. Okay. And so I brought that to the attention of the author of the book, Andy Weir. Mm -hmm. And he says, yeah, yeah, but you got to give me one. You got to give me at least that. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't have a story. <laughs> yeah. So the point is, when I connect it that way, I'd like to believe, perhaps mm -hmm. delusionally, but I think not, that you will now think about air pressure differently and yeah. the effects of a wind. And you look at Mars and because I've connected it in ways that that – you yeah. had to think about and wonder about in your life, provided you had seen the movie. And maybe if yeah. you hadn't seen the movie, you're going to see the movie. All right. Yeah. It was very successful, had a lot of famous people in it, a marquee director. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, who's the director there? It was, um, uh, <clears throat> he directed Alien. Um, gosh, why does his name escape me in this moment? But anyway, it's a, a yeah. famous, so marquee director, uh, a full up Hollywood budget, which yeah. is where it really counts. And so, yeah. So that's I mean, that's what I do. So oh, you're, you're actually thing. bringing forward, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one last thing. I think humor matters. Yeah. yeah if people sure. smile and they even laugh while they're learning, then the learning becomes a joyous experience. And then yeah. they come back for more. So in my podcast, Star Talk, Star Talk. Yeah. we've taken this recipe. In Star Talk, it is science woven together with humor mm -hmm. because my co-host is a professional stand-up comedian who's also smart and knows, can see the humor in things that where others can't. And that's where you really yeah. need somebody like that. So he's a, a force of levity. The science is a force of gravity. <laughs> And we bring in the pop culture and that becomes the total experience of the listener. And so yeah. we're very happy with what we've, we've developed there. And so that's, if I were to offer some advice, that's what it would be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've basically answered a list of the questions that I had, but with, with that answer, but I'm just going to ask a little bit more because you mentioned based on the scene in Martian, because you said, you know, actually thinking about it, it, this wouldn't be possible, right? I mean, this kind of it leads me in the direction because as scientists, we are trained to think critically about everything. So we, we train ourselves to read papers or read articles with, with a critical viewpoint on them, even if they are, you know, published and whatever, right? So we, we train ourselves to do this and we're sort of having to employ this to daily news and everything nowadays. So how important do you think is employing this scientific method to every single piece of information which is out there because there can be all different types of information which which may not necessarily have the same gravitas or the same actual factual basis as what you know like or what scientific information does so how do you how do you encourage that in someone how do you yeah, encourage I don't, I don't people think you can think I think it's deeper than that it has to show up in the school system kindergarten yeah. through the end of high school where the science has to be taught not as a satchel of facts to be mm -hmm. tested at the end of the year on your final exam. It needs to be taught also, yes, there's important facts you need to know. What is DNA and yeah. how does an you know, engine work and what is a greenhouse gas? Yes. yes, that's information that you need to know. But you need to add to that a knowledge of what science is and how and why it works. Mm -hmm. And 
I think what has happened is people heard that, oh, you have to be skeptical of information. And then you have people skeptical of information that they don't need to be skeptical of because it's been demonstrated uh, by repeated observation and experiment. Oh, but I'm still skeptical. I think there's a, I think, um, I, I think there's a conspiracy and I think there's this and they don't know when there's sufficient information to move on mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and when there isn't. So it's that skepticism to an extreme. Yeah. And in, in, in those cases, again, these are people who have not been properly trained how to think about information and what actually happens when data converts to information, information becomes knowledge and knowledge becomes wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. There's an arc there that benefits from the methods and tools of science. And those methods and tools are, are hardly ever taught in the science class. In fact, they should be taught every single year you're in school and apply to all different situations. And then you, by the time you get out, you're equipped, you're armed and dangerous. Uh, <laughs> no, not, that's not the right reference. You are inoculated against uh, false information that could be coming your way. Yeah. You're, you're armed with the right tools you need to be out there in the, in, in yeah, the free flowing the information world. Feels combative, whereas yeah. inoculated feels more. Okay. You're, you're passively protected. Like, yeah, but inoculated also sort of sounds a bit like vaccines or something. <laughs> so, I mean, that kind of leads me on to the... Actually, yeah, if you're anti-vaccine, I, I guess you don't want to be inoculated for anything, right? <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, it kind of makes me ask this question. So how would you differentiate between what is knowledge and what is belief? Because that's where most of the questions that we come up arise, right? Like, for example, if, you know, two people are debating a specific topic, the debate may not necessarily be fruitful because not, I mean, both the ideas won't carry the same weight. One may be based on a belief, the other may be based on facts and knowledge. And bringing the belief-based argument to the same table sort of equates it. So how do you deal with these situations? I never agree to participate in debates for that reason. Yeah, I, You've never seen me debating anybody about anything. Uh, a debate implies that whoever, well, it doesn't imply this, but in practice, the person who wins a debate, quote, wins a debate, however you judge that, you take a vote of the audience or whatever, is often the person who's most articulate or most charismatic or the person whose personality you like better or mm -hmm. the person who sounds convincing whether or not they are communicating factual information. And so science is not decided on debate. Science is decided on data. And the, dif the difference is you and I can walk into a room we could be arguing about something scientific on the frontier because we're not arguing about something that's not on the frontier on, yeah. because it's established on the frontier. And there's a built in contract between us mm -hmm. that con we don't have to explicitly state it because we already know it exists in that conversation, in that debate with you, either I'm right and you're wrong, you're right and I'm wrong yeah. or we're both wrong. Yeah. In a rare case, we could differ and both be right, but that's extremely rare. So, yeah. But we know this. And typically, it ends by saying, we need data of this nature to distinguish this too. Yeah. Now let's yeah. go out for a beer, right? <laughs> so <laughs> the, the yeah. scientist is not generally going to end in a fistfight yeah. or name calling because of that implicit contract that we walked in uh, already knowing of what we have yeah. to adhere to. So that's the difference. Now, in terms of knowledge and belief, you know, in a free country, you should believe what you want. But your belief system is, um, you have to recognize that not everyone will share your belief system because belief system almost by construct are not objectively established truths. Mm -hmm. They're things you believe to be true. Often it's by virtue of your religion or some other point of uh of uh, uh, cultural philosophy that you adhere to. Okay. So my point is in a pluralistic country, such as the United States or the UK, m much of Europe, if you're in a pluralistic country and you have a strong belief system and you rise to power and you choose to create laws and legislation, 
based on that belief system, you are now forcing people who don't share those beliefs Mm -hmm. to have those beliefs or to adhere to those beliefs. Well, that's a different country. That's not a free, open, pluralistic society. That's a dictatorship. So my sense of this is the only kinds of laws that can or should be passed are those that are based in objective reality. Because objective reality applies to everyone, whether you believe in that objective reality or not. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, we've come to the end of our discussion. So for the sake of time, I just want to ask you one last question to end it up. So as a young researcher like me or grad student, what would be our responsibility uh, in terms of communicating science? And what would be your advice? Because we as a part of the scientific community should be upfront now trying to defend facts, right? So what do you say is our responsibility at the moment? You want to make the objective, objectively real world as attractive as possible to those who are in denial of such facts. And to do so means not calling them an idiot or, or criticize. You find ways to bring them into the conversation and reveal to them the beauty and grandeur and majesty of all that is objectively true in this world. And if they have a belief system that doesn't affect anybody else, that's fine. But if they try to get other people to participate, tell them the fun part about the world is that we have all different belief systems and we can all get along. But if you want to make rules that affect all of civilization, objective reality matters. So you have to sort of leave your belief system at the door and come into the room and figure out how to solve these problems. And so, and I think a level of compassion is necessary there. Otherwise, you're just going to be talking to the wall or to others who agree with everything that you say and do, and therefore you've convinced no one. Yeah. All right. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure talking talking to you. And we really hope you can come and join us sometime, maybe live in person, you know, talk to a few of us and as part of the PhD network, and they would really love to have you there. Okay, well, thanks for having me and for thinking about it and for the, the plug for the book. <laughs> oh, for sure. If, if people are interested, they should definitely pick up a copy of A Brief Welcome to the Universe. Mm-hmm. We, I, mm-hmm. We'll put the link to purchase the book in the descriptions down below. Excellent, excellent. All right. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot for joining us. We'll catch you. Yeah. All right. You heard from the man. You heard what he said. So if you're interested in the book please make sure to pick up a copy of A Brief Welcome to the Universe. You'll find the links in the show notes below as well as in the description of this specific YouTube video. And feel free to reach out to us with any feedback, comments or suggestions about anything that we've done in the past. If you haven't listened to other episodes before, please make sure to check them out. If you're a person in the scientific or academic industry, I'm sure you'll enjoy some of the other episodes that we have as well all right so i think with that we've come to the end of this rather wonderful discussion with dr neil degrasse tyson and i'll see you all next week for another exciting new episode until then stay safe stay healthy bye-bye Awesome Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD in Science Communication Working Group known as the Awesome Magazine. The intro outro music is composed by Nathan Amkumar and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. If you'd like to give us any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phcnet.mpg.de. You can also follow us on Twitter at mpphcnetpodcast and on Instagram at offspringmagazine underscore the podcast. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy, and have a nice week and have a nice day. Bye-bye.